Tonight's speaker. I'm so excited to introduce Rachel Carnell. She's a professor of English at Cleveland State University. She's the author of several works, including The Political History of the British Novel, um, a five volume selected works on, oh goodness. Del Ripier Manley. I was going <laughs> to, I was probably going to butcher it. And, <laughs> and Del Ripier, she also featured a political biography on her, and she's going to feature heavily in tonight's book that's going to be the focus. She has also written about a dozen um, op-ed columns over the past few years, linking between the uh, revolution in 1710 to today's political situation. And I have to tell you all, I've been reading them, and it is fascinating <laughs> it's so weird that something so long ago feels so current it's been fascinating to see and tonight she's going to be discussing her latest work backlash uh libel impeachment and populism in the reign of queen anne which tells the fascinating and entertaining account of queen anne and the true story behind the Whig government you may be familiar with this from the oscar nominated movie the favorite so thank you, and let's join me in welcoming Rachel. Thanks so much to the Hudson Library and Historical Society, Society for inviting me. I'm actually gonna start with a PowerPoint because a lot of this is a piece of history that not everyone knows a lot about. So I'm just gonna share a screen and then make sure everyone can see what I'm saying. Is that, uh, Alexandra, is that everything visible to people, the PowerPoint, slide one? It looks great. All right, okay, so good evening again, and thank you for having me. I would just like to contextualize this evening's event by saying that the organizers suggested the date of April 6th because it's World Tartan Day, which they thought I could link to Queen Anne, who ruled England and Scotland between 1702 and 1714. In fact, yes, Anne was the last of the Stuart monarchs, the Scottish royal line that took the English crown when Elizabeth died in 1603. James VI of Scotland became simultaneously James I of England. After Anne, none of whose children lived to adulthood, the throne went to the House of Hanover, George I, II, and III. Just to finish off with this somewhat tenuous link to World Tartan Day, which is a Canadian celebration of Scottish heritage, there are no portraits of Anne wearing tartan. That was a Victorian trend for the British monarchs. But Anne did in fact live in Edinburgh with her father, James, then Duke of York in the winter of 1680 to 81, before she married and before her father took the English throne as James II in 1685. Anne's most important connection to Scotland, of course, is that she was responsible for the Act of Union, which joined England with Scotland in 1707 to form Great Britain. A union that, while not originally popular with the Scottish people, was flexible and evolved over the centuries, gradually granting more autonomy to Scotland. The 1707 Union, moreover, inspired the early United States. John Jay in the Federalist Papers refers to it as a model that unified federal government, providing, in Queen Anne's words, which he cited, the solid foundation of lasting peace. The Union may also be understood as something of a precursor to the European Union itself, a coalition that demonstrates the advantages for peace and prosperity when groups of nations voluntarily establish forms of shared governance. Paradoxically, Brexit may mark the dissolution of the 1707 Union with Scotland, uh, if Scotland, which strongly favored staying in the EU, now votes to leave the UK. So keep your eye on the SNP, the Scottish National Party, and we'll see what happens. Before diving into the real subject of my book, Libel, Impeachment, and Populism in the Reign of Queen Anne, I do just want to give a shout out to Anne, this underappreciated monarch who was not Anne Boleyn, executed life of Henry VIII, but was queen in her own right, not married to a king. Her husband was merely prince consort, as is the current queen's husband. Anne was one of the last British monarchs to actually govern in a very hands-on way having no prime minister and meeting regularly with her cabinet ministers every Sunday afternoon and often daily with her Lord Treasurer. She wrote numerous letters every day by hand with impeccable penmanship, despite suffering from severe gout and arthritis. Unlike today's member of the royal family, if we are to judge from what we know from the crown, who aren't allowed to have any hand in governing the country and aren't even supposed to express opinions about politics. Moreover, Anne had a deep appreciation of the checks and balances of Parliament and understood very well that no one in Britain was above the rule of law, even the monarch herself. So the reign, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, that went out of order. The reign of this tumultuous 
um, uh, the man of this remarkable but underappreciated monarch is the backdrop to the tale I tell in my book of the tumultuous year, November 1709 to November 1710, the year of libel, impeachment, and populism. While perhaps not as tumultuous as the COVID year, March 2020 to April 2021 has felt for us today, there are nevertheless important parallels between then and now. The tumultuous events of 1710 may be understood as an expression of backlash to a prior period of political liberalization that had begun with the glorious revolution of 1688, the events of which marked an abrupt and progressive change in government structure and a sudden and increased toleration for religious minorities, political changes that were not popular with everyone. Oh, and I'm just gonna back up for a second. Um, sorry about that, this cue with the slides. Um, the fun fact that somehow I bleeped over was that the connection between um, Queen Anne and the current mo monarch was that Olivia Coleman, of course, played both roles there. So let's fast forward to where we were with um, 1688. Um, the tumultuous events of um, 1710 may be understood as an expression of backlash to this prior period of political liberalization, and that began with the Glorious Revolution. The period of political liberalization against which there would be a backlash in 1710 began in 1688 when Parliament authorized a political coup against James II, a Catholic, by declaring his Protestant son-in-law and daughter, William of Orange and Mary, the new monarchs of England. That also put Anne, Mary's younger sister, next in line to the throne. This all happened after William had been invited to invade England by some high-ranking Whigs to save the nation from his Catholic father-in-law and from James II's newborn Catholic son, who took precedence to the succession over Mary and Anne, James' older Protestant daughters. William of Orange landed in Devon on November 5, 1688, with 40,000 troops. While it was promoted afterwards as glorious, the revolution was not entirely bloodless, although the fighting stopped fairly soon after many high-ranking military leaders defected from James II to William, demonstrating their fear of increasingly absolutist Catholic rule. When Parliament subsequently declared that James had abdicated and that William and Mary were joint monarchs, Parliament was establishing its power over an otherwise inherited monarchical line, setting up a move to a more classically liberal style of government in which the legislative branch asserts its equality with and even authority over the executive branch, a change that would inspire American colonists to set up a democratic republic in 1776. In 1689, William and Mary signed into law the Bill of Rights, establishing parliament and the rule of law as more powerful than the monarch and ensuring basic liberties to individual citizens. Parliament also passed the Toleration Act in 1689, which allowed dissenting Protestants, including Presbyterians, Baptists, and others who did not take communion in the Church of England to practice their religion freely. Moreover, in 1695, a new era of press freedom commenced without the censoring constraints of a government licensor. In 1702, Anne took the throne after the deaths of Mary, then William, and in 1707, England passed the Act of Union with Scotland. Meanwhile, the British commander, John, Duke of Marlborough, was scoring military victories for the Protestant allies in Europe over the absolute monarch, Louis XIV, helping to establish a European balance of power between Protestant and Catholic nations. By 1709, the Whigs in Britain were proud of the political progress they had made in defending their parliamentary Protestant monarchy against the threat of Catholic absolutism and French expansionist military might. Their queen, Anne, a moderate Tory, likewise took pride in all these achievements. Now, just to clarify here, the term Whig came into parlance in this era to refer to those who had supported the Glorious Revolution, even though plenty of Tories also supported the new power of Parliament, including Queen Anne herself. All this Swiss progress, however, produced a backlash which was ignited by this provocative figure. Every year since 1689, there had been sermons on Guy Fawkes Day, the 5th of November, which celebrated Britain's double victory against Catholicism, first in foiling the gunpowder plot, 5th of November, 1605, and second in William of Orange's landing on English soil on November 5th, 1688. Every November 5th, sermons celebrated the glorious Protestant revolution principles that had underpinned the governments in 1689. Unexpectedly, however, on November 5th, 1709, this eloquent Tory clergyman, Dr. Henry Sesseverell, preached a sermon at St. Paul's Cathedral, praising passive obedience to the monarch rather than the power of parliament and questioning religious toleration 
implicitly repudiating those liberalizing principles of 1688. The published sermon sold like hotcakes and the Whigs in government wanted to punish this Dr. Sacheverell so as to discourage other clergy from preaching against the basic foundations of parliamentary monarchy. However, the published version was carefully edited and would be difficult to prosecute under a charge of libeling a government official. The Whigs in Parliament then made a decision to impeach this clergyman. Now, in this era in Britain, impeachment could in theory be used against any person in the realm except the monarch, since the monarchy was an inherited position. Impeachment was most often used against royal cabinet members to protest unpopular royal policies. Impeachment um, Impeachments were, for example, taken against royal cabinet members during the reigns of Edward III, Richard II, Richard III, but it wasn't a very common practice. Overall, it was used only about 70 times between 1376 and 1806. However, the Whigs at this point in 1709 felt it was their only option. That same week in November 1709, Charles Spencer, Earl of Sunderland, a Whig cabinet member and son-in-law to the Duke of Marlborough, as well as ancestor of the 20th century Princess Diana, arrested a best-selling female Tory satirist, Del Rivier Manley, for mocking Whig government officials in her best-selling political secret history, secret memoirs and manners of several persons of quality of both sexes from the new Atalantis, which recounted gossip about the sex lives of well-known Whigs at court, think primary colors about the Clinton White House or fire and fury inside the Trump White House as modern day secret histories. This arrest of Mrs. Manley contradicted prior Whig support for a free press. The Whigs made a mistake again in terms of optics. Manley was not any old Grub Street hack, but the daughter of a royalist military commander who had been knighted by Charles II. She was of a family that held a coat of arms longer than the Duke of Marlborough. She would shortly become friends with the Tory satirist Jonathan Swift, with whom she would collaborate on subsequent works of political satire. Her fascinating life and works, however, would be diminished by later historians, including Winston Churchill, who labeled her notorious and a woman of disreputable character in his bi biography of his ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough. He was angry, of course, about her Tory satire of his Whig ancestors. While the House of Commons voted swiftly to impeach Sacheverell in mid-January 1710, delays to the House of Lords meant the trial would not start until late February. Worse for the Whigs, the Lords voted to include both chambers, Commons and Lords, in a public trial, which would take place in Westminster Great Hall, a huge medieval structure for which Christopher Wren designed special scaffolding to accommodate up to 2,000 people. The Whigs became increasingly concerned in the weeks leading up to the trial that the preacher was treated sympathetically in the pamphlets that were daily being published, an engraving of him at top here, with softer features than the scowl on his oil portrait, also caught the attention of society ladies. Just before the trial started, the Whigs dropped their libel prosecution against Mrs. Manley, so they wouldn't be seen as prosecuting a lady satirist and a preacher in the same month. Thus, sales of Manley's new Atalantis once again proceeded and increased following the publicity of her arrest. She also began a sequel in which the Cheverell played a heroic role. While inside Westminster Hall, Whig impeachment managers from the House of Commons proclaimed Parliament's power over the monarch and the liberal principles of the Glorious Revolution that the Cheverell had repudiated in his published sermon outside Westminster Hall, Populist mobs took to the streets, often destroying churches where dissenting Protestants worshipped. In this image, a Presbyterian church enacting violent protest against the Toleration Act of 1689. These riots were exacerbated by populist anger stemming from a bad harvest, the increasing costs of a foreign war, and an influx of German-speaking immigrants from Europe. Some of this destruction, though, was planned carefully in advance, and some of the participants were hired thugs paid for by influential Tory supporters of Sacheverell. Ironically, this mob violence was a strange expression of support for a sermon about passive obedience, not violent uprising. In all of this, Queen Anne appears as something of an unsung heroine, attending the trial every day and showing her support for Parliament's right to impeach a clergyman for preaching passive obedience to her. Moreover, on the day when local law enforcement officials were overrun by the mob, she allowed her personal palace guard to help manage the violent protesters. Unguarded at St. James Palace, she asserted that God would be her guard. 
Significantly, all the armed forces were careful not to shed innocent blood as they arrested the protesters. In fact, thanks to the soldiers' superb discipline, the riots were contained without a single shot being fired and with only about 50 casualties. The Whig impeachment managers in control of Parliament were incredibly persuasive and effective at getting the votes in the House of Lords to impeach. And here, with a nod to today's world, I would just say that members of the House of Lords were not elected but held their offices by their aristocratic titles. And so we're not basing their votes on electoral calculations. But the Tories outmaneuvered them by impeaching Sasevalov, then passing only the lightest of punishments, merely forbidding him from preaching for three years. Meanwhile, his supporters feted him in ceremonies across England for the next six months. At every stop, he lauded those who had voted against impeachment, ensuring that impeachment be front and center in every voter's mind for the parliamentary elections in November. Tory voters often marched to the polls carrying an engraved print of Sacheverell's portrait. And as you can see here, Sacheverell in this image is surrounded by um, members of the House of Lords who voted in his favor not to impeach him. These elections of 1710 were also marked by the violence of Sacheverell's supporters trying to prevent Whigs from casting their ballots. And this at a moment in history when only 3% of the population could vote. The published lists of who had voted for and against impeachment and the sermons preached in favor of Sacheverell helped the Tories win by a landslide in November, gaining a majority in parliament of almost two to one. The Tory majority in turn helped Anne bring the war of Spanish succession to a faster close. As those of you who may know who watched the film The Favorite, which did not cover Sacheverell's trial in the same year or the parliamentary election, Anne and her former friend, Sarah, Duchess of Marlborough, also fell out at this time. In an unexpected coincidence, the last day they ever saw each other in person was April 6th, 1710. So this talk tonight is taking place on the anniversary of that rupture. This rupture between Sarah and Anne was actually not because of a lesbian love triangle, as suggested in that film but a matter of political lobbying. The rumors of Anne's lesbianism were an attempt by the Whigs, including the Duchess herself, to embarrass Anne and separate her from her bedchamber woman, Abigail Massam, who had become a confidant of the Queen. The Queen's closeness to Abigail was not a problem because it involved lesbian intimacy, but because Abigail was a mouthpiece for the Tory policy preferences, including bringing the war to a close. Now, for anyone who wants more detail um, about Queen Anne's intense emotional friendships with women. I can cover some of that in the Q&A. Sarah kept her distance from court after this last rupture and was dismissed from all her court offices the following January. The queen, meanwhile, began dismissing the Marlboroughs, other close friends and family members who also held court positions. After another year of military campaigns, the queen even dismissed the Duke of Marlborough, victor of the Battle of Blenheim. With Marlborough dismissed, the war was quickly brought to a close. The Whigs complained that they were abandoning their allies on the continent, but in fact, all the European powers were running out of funds to continue the war. In the Treaty of Utrecht, um, 1714, Great Britain gained some important economic advantages, including the ports of Gibraltar and Menorca, as well as control over the slave trade in the Spanish Empire, controlled previously held by France. Moreover, the treaty is considered significant by historians because it asserted for the first time the importance of maintaining a balance of power in Europe. The Tory backlash to the revolution of 1688 that had begun with Sacheverell's sermon in 1709 and was followed by the Tory victory in the elections in 1710 ended abruptly with the death of Queen Anne in 1714. Under King George I, Anne's German Protestant successor and a Whig sympathizer, the Whigs regained control of Parliament in the elections of 1715. Various of Anne's cabinet members were impeached after they left office for giving pernicious advice to the former Queen about the Treaty of Utrecht. But Parliament sought few impeachments during the rest of the 18th century. While a high profile trial against the former British governor of India, Warren Hastings, took place in 1787, just as the American founders were sitting down to write the US Constitution with its impeachment clause, the political downside to impeachment as a check and balance was making the process obsolete in Britain. To get back to the problem of those partisan divisions between Tories and Whigs, which were so um, intense at that time, even to the point that Tories and Whigs would frequent different coffee houses in London, the temperature of those divisions was eventually lowered, not just because a new monarch came to the throne, 
But there was a structural change as well with the law passed, the Septennial Act, changing the time between parliamentary elections from three years to seven. Fewer election cycles meant less party factionalism. The backlash against the impeachment trial, which the Whigs had used as a set piece to defend the principles of the Glorious Revolution, had the effect of making Whigs careful how they subsequently referred to that revolution. As the historian Steve Pincus observes, while the Whig impeachment managers had emphasized the radical reading of the revolution of 1688 during Sacheverell's trial in 1710, by the 1720s, the Whigs referred to 1688 as much less revolutionary. The Tory backlash of 1710 in tempering the language of revolutionary change may in fact have enabled long-term political progress without another revolution. Meanwhile, just to finish off with the cast of characters, after Queen Anne's death in 1714, the Marlboroughs returned to power at court under George I. Mrs. Manley published several other best-selling works of satire, while Dr. Sacheverell faded into obscurity. The Duchess of Marlborough remained a powerful force in Whig opposition political movements, even against Robert Walpole and others, until her death in 1744, having outlived Queen Anne by three decades. I'll be happy to take questions on anything in the slideshow or in the longer version of this story that I develop in the book, which includes much more about the personal relationships between the Marlboroughs and the Queens and the fascinating life of Delivervier Manley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I have to say I've been thoroughly enjoying the book and I've been constantly surprised how familiar the story feels in so many ways. Um, I was wondering, I have a few questions before we open it up to the rest of everybody viewing tonight. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A and we'll get to them later this evening. So my first question is, what inspired you to write this particular book? Um, you mentioned that Queen Anne's story is not one that many people are familiar with, so I'm wondering what sparked your interest. Right, well, I'm a literature professor, and I got into this because I had first been writing about the political history of the British novel, which we can start at about the reign of Queen Anne. And through that, I got interested in the political secret histories, which influenced the, the rise of the novel. And then I got interested in Mrs. Manley, Delarivier Manley. Um, I edited her works, I wrote a biography of her. And as I was diving into her life and all the events of this year that she was um, arrested for libel and then released, um, I realized there was this incredible story to tell. And at first, when I thought about it, I thought, I'll tell the story of, of Queen Anne, um, the Duchess of Marlborough, and Mrs. Manley, the Duchess, the satirist, and the Queen. And so that was the story in my head. And I wanted to take it through a nice 12-month calendar year to get that narrative arc. Um, and that would have been the title had we not had all the interesting developments in our own political history in the last four or five years with populist movements, impeachment trials, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I took the hook from current events to get the libel impeachment and populism. But the story was of Queen Anne, whom I just feel that everyone should know more about. I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about Queen Anne. And I've been wondering, as I've been reading the book, do you think some of, you mentioned talking about the moderating of the Glorious Revolution and later time, like as years gone by, they really moderated this revolution to just kind of silence it. Do you think some of that also helped quiet Queen Anne's history? The, 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 the thing about Queen Anne's story is that it first got narrated by the Duchess of Marlborough. Yeah. The Queen Anne, the Queen Anne didn't Queen Anne didn't leave a memoir. In fact, she was she was bright, but she wasn't a real conversationalist. And I think she was drawn to people like the Duchess of Marlborough and even Abigail Massam. Um, because they had a way with words and they had a kind of a wit. Um, and I think she loved it when other people kind of captured um, what she really wanted to say or the ideas that were in her head. And of course, the Duchess in her um, account of the Duchess of Marlborough that she published in um, 1742, she told her own story of these events, um, which I think didn't do Queen Anne justice. No, I don't think they did. I doubt that was her intention. Well, and also she didn't reign that long compared to Elizabeth. So that she had, you know, she had this active union. She had this this incredible um, victory over the French um, with, with, you know, the, the Battle of Blenheim, the, the Treaty of Utrecht. But for some reason, she doesn't really get enough credit for, I think, everything that she did for, for Britain. No, and I was just, I mean, I think it was a comp... I feel like obviously the Duchess of Marlborough's story did not help things. 
Um, but she just feels kind of lost when it, at the same time yeah. when there's so much happening. Well, and the other thing is, if you actually go looking for her in the palaces in London, <laughs> if you go to Kensington Palace or if you go to Hampton Court Palace, the only p way that you can trace out the rooms, like the rooms where the last argument happened between the Duchess and Sarah, April 6, 1710, uh, these rooms, you have to go into the William and Mary rooms. So the rooms are done up from the 1690s. They're not even done up in her reign. I'm not sure how much she would have changed the decor, but the point is she's actually sort of written out of history by the architectural historians who designed the tourist circuits at Kensington and Hampton Court. So it is fascinating um, to sort of like seek her in the shadows. I was actually just there at around the time when The Favorite came out and someone had asked, um, was this where she was? <laughs> it was a very <laughs> question if she was actually in this place where she actually did live, but. Just, yeah, that whole argument took place. The Queen, uh, Sarah actually chased the Queen across town from St. James Palace to Kensington because the, the Queen was trying not to meet in person. But anyway, Sarah tracked her down. Fantastic. Um, I'm wondering if you could, I know you touched on it a bit in your PowerPoint, if you could explain a bit more on the background of the two political parties and their fraction and what led to their fraction and what was, where did the major players come in? Right, and it's confusing too because Whig has a whole other meaning for American history. But as I said in the PowerPoint, that term Whig was applied after 1688 uh, to the people who had supported the Glorious Revolution. Now, so you could say on the one hand, the Whigs have a more progressive stance. They want shared power between parliament and the monarch, even more than there had been power sharing since the Magna Carta. And that the Tories were more traditional patriarchalist and all that's true. And you could say in some, sort of broadly scripted sense of this. The Tories were landowners and the Whigs were merchants. Now there were plenty of Whig landowners, but merchants did tend to be Whig and dissenting Protestants, um, Presbyterians, Baptists, etc. cetera, um, they tended to be Whigs. But the, the pure Tories, of course, um, after 1688, wouldn't swear allegiance, allegiance to William and Mary when they took the throne when crowned in 1689, because James II, Mary's father, was still alive in exile in France. And so the purest Tories were finally comfortable coming back up to court when Anne took the throne, because Anne took the throne in 1702, and her father had died in 1701. And of course, she was direct, you know, descendant of, of James II. So the Tories came back up to court then. Um, and then the whole notion that it was the Whigs who supported the Glorious Revolution and the Tories didn't. Well, that became moot once Anne took the throne because Anne was a Tory and she totally respected the Glorious Revolution. It was that that had brought her to the throne rather than her Catholic half-brother, James Francis Edward Stuart, known to history as the old pretender when he got older. Um, but she, um, she owed her throne to the Glorious Revolution, but also she was just terrifically respectful of the power sharing, even though they were impeaching someone who was preaching in homage to her and in support of her. She said, no, she came to the impeachment trial every day. That's the right thing. They have to impeach this guy. They did the right thing. She even thanked parliament afterwards uh, when the impeachment trial was over. So you know, she just totally understood and respected uh, the revolution of uh, 1688, even though she was a Tory. So that difference between Tories and Whigs, um, it also had a sort of um, an economic fallout because if to the extent that there were Tory more, perhaps more, major Tory landowners than Whig, and, that, and that's debatable. Um, the tax for the war fell harder on the landowners than it did on people who had wealth as merchants. But interestingly, in terms of one example of a Whig landowner, I mentioned the Duke and Duchess's son-in-law, Charles Spencer, Earl of Sunderland. His estate is also, of course, where um, Diana, Princess Diana's um, memorial is. So, that, so that's a big landed estate that's Whig. So, so it's hard to draw hard and fast distinctions between Whig and Tory, but there is roughly one's a little more conservative and one's a little more progressive, roughly speaking. <laughs> Thank you. I have just a few more questions before we get to everybody else's who are submitting them. Um, so I just want to say, I feel like this story highlights so many strong females, um, whether for good or bad, um, especially at a time when females could not vote. Um, in fact, you said only 3% of the population actually could, and of that three, females were definitely not part of it. Um, I just think it's very interesting, especially like between Delivery, um, Manly, Sarah, the Duchess of Marbo, and Queen Anne, how they were working both behind and in front of the scenes to manipulate 
the different changes politically. Was that something you were aware of or did you uncover as you were researching? I just wanted to bring this to light because, as I said, my, my, my first uh, working title of this book was The Duchess, the Satirist, and the Queen, because this was an era where the Queen was a totally hands-on monarch, making this transition, you know, securing the sort of the legacy of the Glorious Revolution, making that union with Scotland, forming Great Britain of that, of that era. And then um, the Duchess was the most powerful lobbyists the Whigs had. I mean, she annoyed Anne because she kept on saying, the Whigs need, need you to do this. The Whigs need you to put, um, you know, appoint these Whig bishops and these Whig cabinet ministers, or they won't vote in Parliament to pass next year's campaign for the war funding. And the war funding is to keep Louis XIV at bay and your Catholic half-brother who's living in a palace under funded by Louis XIV to keep him from coming over and taking your throne. So it was sort of a form of... Um, Sarah was as Anne's closest friend since the 1670s, um, and she was mistress of the privy purse, she was uh, mistress of the robes, she had all kinds of power at court. Um, but when she was angry and when she was trying to influence Anne, her method of trying to manipulate people was to shut them out and be very cold to them uh, in terms of human friendship. So um, that coldness really hurt Anne and that really led to the rupture, but the coldness was because she was trying to force Anne to do the Whig bidding. Um, and, and the powerful Whigs in the Commons and the Lords wanted to use Sarah as a lobbyist until it backfired. Um, and then Manley is just this fascinating figure. There are very few female satirists in the 18th century. Um, and she just, I mean, she had an interesting life of her own. Her, her, her cousin said, if, her, pre, her, her still married cousin pretended his wife had died and then married her and ruined her. And she ended up um, in court circles because she became a companion to the Duchess of Cleveland who had been Charles II's mistress and then young John Churchill's mistress in the 1670s. So she picked up all this court gossip from the 1660s and 1670s and she rolled it into this treatment of the Whigs at court now in their heyday, like the Duke of Marlborough. She was writing gossip about him when he was a, a 20 year old kind of um, young thing at court getting seduced by the Duchess of Cleveland. So she had this gossip. She had decades of gossip at her fingertips. And she wrote um, and she and she spun this stuff out and she totally transformed what had been to some extent a, a sort of um, a more straightforward form of telling stories um, about court and politics. And she wove it into this complex tapestry of all these different intermingling anecdotes of all the different people you might meet in court at London. Um, yeah, and it had an incredible effect. I mean, the Whigs, uh, Lord Sunderland, <laughs> um, arrested her for libel because it was really catching everyone's interest. And what they were doing, if you look at copies and archives, they were sort of writing in the margin, oh, this person is this person, and this person is this person, so <laughs> that the Churchills or the the, um, the Marquis and Marchioness of Caria and, um, Abigail Massam is Hilaria, um, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, Queen Anne is Princess Olympia. So that they're, they, she, everyone was having a fun time finding all the connections between her storyline um, and everyone they knew all around them. So it was, it was, it was just, um, and because it was so interesting to people and so riveting, it sold and it got people discussing and it got people mocking the wigs in a way that made it more feasible for Anne to start dismissing Whigs in 1710. Yeah, it's just, it, the whole, it's just very fascinating to see how working behind the scenes, they influence so much of everything that results both politically and continuing on. Yeah, the power of the pen if you didn't have the power of the ballot or the voice in parliament. <laughs> exactly. I want to do, I want to touch on one more thing before we jump into everyone's, our audience questions. I just want to talk about the movie The Favorite, yeah. um, which I enjoyed. And I love that Olivia Coleman is in both <laughs> the crowd. <Yes. laughs> She's playing two queens. Um, I just want to talk about, I know, obviously, they took a lot of liberties with the movie, mm -hmm. as they all do. Although I do think the true story is ridiculously fascinating <laughs> in yeah. itself. I was wondering if you could touch on the movie, like stuff that they got right, what they got wrong. What was your take on it? Right. I think the movie is interesting because it captures, it captures Abigail's political influence. It captures the fact that she was actually lobbying to get out of the war. I and mean, that's kind of comes through nicely. Um, 
and it captures kind of the intensity of Anne's friendships with women. Um, and that intensity is, it's interesting if you read the letters because um, the letters that Anne and Sarah exchanged, and oftentimes now Sarah had court offices, but often Sarah was ho at home giving birth. She had six children of her own. She couldn't always be up at court waiting on Anne. Anne, meanwhile, was pregnant every year. There was a lot of there was a lot of letter writing going back and forth. And the letters, even from the early 1680s, they just gush. I mean, Queen Anne really loved her female friends. Um, and so the emotional intensity there is also captured by the movie. Now, the people who are the, the biographers of Anne, including the most recent one, um, the biography by Anne Somerset that came out a few years ago, it, their read on it is that um, it, Sarah felt that, Sarah was the one spreading the rumors of the lesbian dark deeds at night between Anne and Massam. And Sarah's take was, Anne admired her and loved her, Sarah, for her mind and for her wit and for her philosophical understanding. Whereas she couldn't have admired Abigail who was of lower social strata slightly, although it was her first cousin, <laughs> but um, that Anne couldn't have been drawn to her for the same reasons she was drawn to Sarah. I actually think she was drawn to both of them for their wit and, and sort of their verbal agility. But um, Sarah saw it as it must've been something lower than that. But Sarah also, although we don't think that there was actual lesbian relationship, if you have to sort of cut it along a sort of a binary, either or, yes or no, um, we wouldn't call it that probably because Anne was devoted to her husband. She was a devout churchwoman. Um, she was annoyed by the accusations, but Sarah kept on making the accusations and she made them in letters to Anne before she and Arthur Mannering, her buddy who was also an MP and pamphleteer, um, writing those ballads with her, they were spreading those rumors to try to shame Anne, and this gets to your point about behind the scenes, to shame Anne into dismissing Abigail because they didn't know how, um, how else to get rid of her. So the emotional intensity is there and actually Abigail's flippancy is accurate in the sense that she once said to Sarah, well, I'm sure the queen will always be very kind to you uh, because <laughs> recognizing that Abigail knew that, the, that she was now in the queen's confidants um, and that Sarah no longer was. So that flippancy is actually interesting. Um, I think the costumes are very provocative. And um, so, as I said, the film, to me, it doesn't capture all this really interesting stuff about Sacheverell and, and Manly. It would have been fun to have had uh, Delivery and Manly as kind of like the third character in that film. But so the, so the film is, is right in spirit. Yeah, I think a lot of it, especially the working, the women working behind the scenes to just manipulate it, I picked up on the book. I was like, it felt right to me. Yeah. But I do have a bunch of questions in the chat if you're Ooh, open good. to event. Okay, we're going to start off. Our first question is from Richard. Approximately what percentage of the English population remained Catholic during the time of Queen Anne's reign? That is a great question. And I do not know. So I would just, I will not try to make something up. I would just say it's a great question and I don't know. Did Queen Anne support the selection of George the first to succeed her? She was fine with that. That was actually passed in the act of succession in 1702, shortly after Anne's only surviving ch child, the Duke of Gloucester died. Um, she was fine with it, but she was a little cautious in the sense that the act of succession wasn't directly to George. It was actually just to George's mother, Sophia. And Anne did not want either Sophia or George, the son, um, to come and live in England uh, or live in London before she died. So she was, she kept them at arm's length, but she, but she knew that has to happen. She did not want the country going back to Catholicism. In the English, um, what happened with Henry VIII um, um, going Protestant and then turning Catholic again under Mary and Mary was known as Bloody Mary. And there were just, there was this trauma imprinted into the British memory about, you know, the Protestant martyrs who had been, you know, um, burned, executed, destroyed under Mary's reign. So that fear of going back to that kind of um, the destruction of Protestants terrified Britain. It was imprinted, as, uh, the Duchess of Marlborough refers to it. Um, so yeah, so that, that fear of Catholicism was, was intense. And so I don't know how many um, families were Catholic. Um, the Catholics had to live five miles outside of London, which is why Alexander Pope lived in Twickenham. That's very fascinating. Um, I do have another question here. Uh, 
who compromised the mob that attacked the meeting house? Was it people with the right to vote or what motivated their attacks on places of worship? So the, the, the Toleration Act of 1689 um, allowed dissenting Protestants who weren't, of course, the Church of England is Protestant, but Baptist, um, Presbyterians, there were a couple of things that annoyed people. One is they weren't Church of England. Like they were different in, in, in these ways. So it's that fear of difference. It's a religious minority. But also there's an economic piece here, too. If you look at that meeting house in the print I had on the screen, um, Burgess's meeting house, it's this large brick building with nice windows. Um, a lot of these dissenting Protestant were merchants, and, and they were doing well. So there was there was pent up anger, and so some of the anger was politically motivated also because, um, you know, the, these these Protestant dissenting um, merchants and whatnot, that whole group of people was having increasing political power, um, and so so there was there was resentment and and the economic power. Plus, these were the merchants getting wealth that wasn't taxed in the same way as landowners. Now, is this the mobs in the street? I mean, mobs can be riled up against people who aren't like us, and so Presbyterians and Baptists aren't Church of England. Um, and then some of them were paid. I mean, there are accounts of you know coins being handed out and the destruction of some of those meeting houses they when they went in and did the court proceedings afterwards it was it was planned in advance so someone said yes there were people um to take her down to take the wooden boards down to carry them out the pews the pulpit they were brought into the street and the wooden stuff that was taken from the inside out was burned so it was it was planned destruction also by Sacheverell's supporters not necessarily entirely um, spontaneous mob behavior. It was a combination. And not quite his peaceful or nonviolent. <laughs> it, it was a weird, it was a weird response to a, a sermon about passive obedience. <laughs> but I think that's the part that makes me laugh quite hard. Um, I have a lot of questions coming in about uh, delivery manly. So yeah. I get on her. Carol um, says she thought your political biography on her is excellent. And do you think Thank there you, could Carol. be of Manley's letters or life still hiding somewhere? Oh, um, I mean, Carol's asking about, so with Manley, I, I did write a biography of her about um, a decade ago or so, and um, we have only a small number of extant letters of her, some of which are to um, Robert Harley um, asking for patronage because um, he was working against the Whigs at this time, and she eventually did get um, 50 pounds from him right before he fell from power in 1714 and Queen Anne died. But I don't think there's a treasure trove of letters in terms of all the archives, and I've been in archives all over Britain. I found more of her father's letters. He was that military commander um, in the 1670s. Uh, I found more of, of his letters. I, I, I wish we had more of her letters, but what we have from Manley is her own version of her own life story. It's something called the Adventures of Ravella in 1714. And the word had it that um, a Whig um, printer, Charles Gilden, was going to publish the Adventures of Ravella, um, the writer of the New Atalantis. And it was going to be a, not a very flattering count, but she went and ch chatted with him as one best-selling author to one rising bookseller and said, look, I could write this or I, I I could pay you and I and I could do this. And and he let her, knowing that if it was by her, it would actually sell well. But her spin on her own life was important because she had a rather complicated life. She was um she she'd come up, and as I said, her father died, her father, that military commander who was knighted by Charles II, a royalist in um knighted after the restoration when Charles came um back to the throne in 1660. Um so that she she comes from a good family, but a family that had to come on hard times. And when her father, um, as military commander, died, she didn't have, she had a small fortune, but this cousin, um, John Manley, uh, who had a wife in Cornwall, popped up into London. He was technically her guardian and somehow or other seduced her and persuaded her to marry him, even though he was already married, but he said his wife had died. And my suspicion is that he actually... He had mortgaged so many of his wife Anne's estates in Cornwall, but he was just, again, strapped for cash, thought he could blow through 
Manley's 200 pounds or something inheritance. And then she was left up in London, high and dry. She, you know, she wanted to be in London. She loved that. But, um, and she, they had, a, they had a child, um, from this big in this union. And then she, she had to fend for herself in London. As I said, she became a ca companion to the Duchess of Cleveland, that um, former mistress of Charles II. She at one point lived for a few years um, as mistress to um, the governor of Fleet Prison, John Tilly, um, and got the gossip from those, the shady dealings in there. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually she hooked up with John Barber, a Tory printer. And that's when um, he started publishing her secret histories and she had a stable place to live sort of near the publishing houses, um, near St. Paul's Cathedral, actually. Uh, as I start the book, I say, as he's, as Sir Cheverell is preaching the sermon, where she was living in Barbara's printing establishment was only a, a few blocks away in the shadow of St. Paul's Cathedral. So she's this fascinating person who um, was arrested for debt. Um, she had to leave London, you know, a few times running out of funds. Um, she lobbied all kinds of influential people to intervene on her behalf. She lobbied Whigs to sponsor some of her plays and be a patron to her. Um, she was really doing whatever she could to kind of make a go of her life. Um, and she ended up doing it by her pen. But it was it was not an easy road or a, a direct line at all. And Carol is absolutely right. I mean, she is she's the person I started with in the story. Um, and she's, and she's figures much more directly in, in many of the chapters in the book that I couldn't really bring her into the PowerPoint as much tonight. And as unfortunately, we don't have an image of her. There is no known portrait of her. So I would have loved to have had her on a slide. That's, um, speaking of, you mentioned her work, Riviella. Um, Rivella, the adventures of Rivella. Yeah. Ken writes in the chat, um, he was wondering if you could speak a bit more about that particular work and the connection to the rise of the novel at this time. So the interesting thing about Manley's writing is um, she's doing all these different anecdotes. And when she, so there's an anecdote all these different anecdotes about all these different characters in the New Atlantis, which is a two volume work. And then there are two more volumes in the sequel, Memoirs of Europe. The Adventures of Rivella is a much shorter piece. Um, and it is it is a kind of a sort of secret history because she puts herself in there and other people in there with pseudonyms. Um, but it's a tiny little thing and it, and, it, and it devolves more into some account of, you know, a various lawsuits. It's sort of it is and isn't about her life. It deflects a lot of the real stuff in her life. But the, the connection to the rise of the novel is that when Manley, so Manley died in 1724 and her works such as the New Atlantis and Memoirs of Europe, which then became four volumes of New Atlantis, they were in print up until there were about seven or eight editions up until about 1720. And then they were out of print for about a decade and then they appeared in the 1730s. They first appeared reprinted in the 1730s in a serial publication called The Weekly Novelist. And the first four volumes of The Weekly Novelist were um, The New Atlantis. And what's, what's strange here is that they don't feel like novels to us. And then, but then she became known as a novelist and people would say, oh, she wasn't a very good novelist. <laughs> Her stuff was too anecdotal. There was no main through line. Well, the point was that she wasn't writing novels with the main through line. She was writing anecdotes. And in fact, the word anecdote comes from Procopius of Cesara's um, um, sort of secret history of um, Justinian I and Theodora. Um, and that was called the anecdoto um, or unpublishable things, which is what anecdota means. Um, and that sort of was picked up and translated into Latin then French and then English and in the middle and late part of the 1600s. So that Manley is working from a tradition of anecdotal takedown of members at court. So the fact that she was misconstrued as a novelist is kind of interesting. And I think it's because so many of her anecdotes actually get so thoroughly inside the heads of her characters. I have one academic article out where I say she almost gets a sort of uh, halfway to free and direct discourse in some of the ways in which she's imagining what's in happening inside the Duke of Bentick's head, for example. So she was a very skillful depictor of people's emotional states, but she wasn't writing sort of the narrative through line. But people then in the 20th century misunderstood her and said, oh, she's just not a very good novelist. When if you go back and reposition her and say she was an incredibly sophisticated and an innovative um, 
secret historian. That's how we've replaced her in history. And we sort of said, if you see her as this kind of like gifted and brilliant and innovative satirist and secret historian, then you see her gifts and her gifts are so strong that she was mistaken for a novelist subsequently and then curiously criticized for not being a very good novelist. Um, so she didn't think of herself as a novelist in the way that we would think of the term in the modern day. But the confusing thing here is also that the word novel in this period had a different meaning. So the word novel in this era has a direct resonance to the French term nouvelle, which means a short story. But the nouvelle or novella, or novelle, these were things which actually have a continental origin. And these are sort of short moralistic tales um, that are and aren't similar to anecdotal political secret histories, but they're shorter things. And so the term novel in this time is used both to mean the short things like the French nouvelle, and it's used to mean um, secret histories. So that um, I have a whole other article called Slipping from Secret History to the Novel because the titles of these things, sometimes it's you know, secret memoirs and manners of the new Atalantis, fine in, in 1709, but then Eliza Haywood, a subsequent best-selling novelist writing 1720s, 30s and 40s, she's using the term secret history sometimes to refer to something that we would just call a novel. And then, but then that word secret history came to be um, the way, you know, Fielding and Defoe would use it, the true story of Daniel, of, you know, the farther adventures of Robinson Crusoe, the, the true story of Pamela Andrews, the, 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 tr the, the true story of, um, um, it, most of the novels of that era are sort of like the true story of something. And so that word truth aligns with the fact that secret histories, which while using fake pseudonyms were actually telling truth about powerful political figures. So there's this overlap in titles in the use of secret history and novel um, from about 1715 to about 1745. So there's that long kind of messy overlap. And Manley is just coming in um, at the beginning of that period, making this um, anecdotal piece of satire a bestseller and, and, and connecting it to people in a new way. Um, and then weirdly at the end of her career, the last thing she produced was The Power of Love in seven novels. And those novels sound nothing like her secret histories, but those are sort of translations going back to much older tales, even from Boccaccio and other sources. So that then the word novel, the only title in which the word novel appears is the work of hers that bears the least resemblance to subsequent novels. So it's a great question and it's incredibly complicated. Sorry, realize that's me. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that. I have a couple more questions. Um, so Richard would like to know about Queen um, how was Queen Anne's marriage negotiated? Elizabeth I, for example, was queen in her own right and notoriously did not marry. Um, and Anne was was and Anne was also queen in her own right. Uh, whether the prospect of marriage proved so dangerous to her that was eventually left unaddressed, were there dangers present for Anne and why? So Anne was married in 1683, and the marriage was not her own choice, but she was married in 1683 long before they really suspected that she would actually take the throne, um, before the Glorious Revolution. Um, but she was married because in 1683, her father married to this younger second wife, Mary of Modena. Um, they were likely to have children, including sons, as they eventually did, although there was, there was that, that son did not appear till 1688, which would have prompted the Glorious Revolution. But she was married at the behest of Charles II, her uncle, um, who was on the throne, obviously, from the restoration of 1660 to when he died in 1685. But she was married um, to the Protestant prince, um, George of Denmark. So both she and her sister Mary were strategically married to Protestant princes. Um, and so when Charles II, so Charles and James II, their mother was a Catholic, but they had left England during the civil wars and then were living in France um, with Catholic family members, but they were coming back to be um, the restoration of uh, Kings of England. Charles II was certainly going to mass in the church of England. I mean, he may also have been secretly a Catholic and he was probably a Catholic behind the time he um, died, but, they were, Charles was making sure that um, James II's 
eldest daughters who were born to James's first wife, Anne Hyde, who was a Protestant. And of course, James was a Protestant at that time. Uh, he made sure they were raised Protestant, really for political reasons. I don't think Parliament would have had, you know, they, they would have been sort of outraged if he started marrying the Protestant daughters um, of his um the heir apparent James II, because Charles only had illegitimate offspring. So we had to go through his brother James's line. But um, Anne was married to a Protestant prince. So Mary was married to William of Orange, a Protestant. Um, she cried, Mary cried, uh, sobbing for weeks before for that marriage. And in the end, it was sort of okay. I don't think it was a huge love match. There was a lot of respect by the time uh, in the end. Um, but Anne and um, Prince George, they really fell for each other. Yes, it was set up, but they they um, they were incredibly close. It, it wasn't the sort of marriage where one is off here and one is off there. They were they were in the same palace at the same time. Um, they said, pregnant seventeen times in eighteen <laughs> years of marriage. I mean, they they had a you know a very close, intimate, um, passionate um, relationship, and they're and it's sort of interesting because. Neither of them made much splash in public. Neither of them was a conversationalist. Some theories are that um, George just didn't have much to say. Others are his English wasn't really very good. He was better in Danish. <laughs> um, and Anne, as we said, she had a lot of ideas in her head. She preferred it when she was surrounded by um, witty and verbally adept um, female courtiers. But she loved her husband. Um, so I, don't, that, that, I think that answers the question. It does. So we have time for one more question. And I'm actually going to, if you bear with me here, I'm going to group. I'm, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm sorry we can't get to everyone today, but there's a lot of questions that all have the same overarching theme. So a lot of it is regarding the relations to today. What can this era teach us? Um, people are also looking at what could this say about the parallels to our time? Um, does history give us hope regarding the populism we see today, which seems destructive to democracy? And I'm trying to see, I'm trying to, I think a lot of people would like to know a little bit more about the similarities from especially Queen Anne's time and this whole rise to today. Yeah, so as I said, I th that's one of the reasons I started writing op-eds. So if you Google op-eds, they're op-eds in the globalist, they're op-eds in the conversation, they're op-eds in the plain <laughs> inside sources. They're out there. Um, and I, I pick a lot of these themes up um, in individual pieces on impeachment, on elections, on political moderation, on prorogation, on um, Lady Hale gets into it. But um the Supreme Court of um, Supreme Justice of, of of Britain, but the the takeaway that's that one of the things that struck me was obviously this this sense of backlash. We have this period. We think we've made some progress, and then suddenly, wait, okay, people are uncomfortable with the way things have moved forward, and they want to turn things in a different direction. And then there's a rise in, in, in populism, and and people have resentment against people who are different, and 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 there's anger and confusion. And so, you know, one takeaway would be that when we make change quickly, it takes people a while to get on board with it. Um, the other takeaway in, um, is that it may be, and this is why I kind of put this in the last slide, that using that language of moderation may be a way to get people on board with change. Um, don't scare them. I, in an op-ed I had in The Plain Dealer shortly after this most recent election, um, last November, um, I, I linked it to the sort of the moderation of of what the what what the what the Whigs took up after Anne died, and, and picking up that thread of moderation. And Robert Walpole, the Whig who rose to power and became an incredibly um, effective prime minister from the 1720s up until he came out of fell out of power in 1742. Um, he was careful in, in using that language of moderation because he had been one of the impeachment managers and it almost lost a seat in parliament <laughs> in, in 1710. So um, he learned that lesson. And so whatever whatever he wanted to do, he, he couched it differently. He didn't couch it as revolution. Um, so so that's one thing that, that I would say. Um, I've written a piece about just after the Second in, or our second recent impeachment. Um, um, I wrote a piece uh, for Inside Sources saying that um, Britain's 
history shows us that the politics of impeachment may make it tricky for it to work as we've planned it. And then various people who read the op-ed reached out to me um, and said, okay, so what did the British do? And of course, it's different in Britain because you don't impeach the prime minister. The prime minister is head of the party. Um, and so it's the party who chooses the prime minister and then you, you, know, you vote for the party. But also the Brits still have that option of calling an election. Um, if two thirds of the MPs say we're gonna have a parliamentary election, we can have one before um, sort of the minimum time would be up. Um, so the Brits have some more options. Um, the Brits also take stuff to the court. I pointed out that when Lady Hale of the Supreme Court in the UK actually chastised Boris Johnson uh, over a year ago for um, proroguing Parliament right at the point where they were trying to discuss the details of Brexit. Proroguing means just pausing. But um, she chastises him in the same way as sort of a court justice, but she's using the language that was typically used previously in Britain when someone impeached a royal cabinet minister for misleading the public. She was accusing Boris Johnson of misleading the public when they, or actually, no, I'm sorry, misadvising the monarch. Yeah, well, misleading the public, but also misadvising the monarch. And he said he misadvised uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who technically reads out the, you know, the prorogation. So, so that partly... If impeachment, um, it has become so politicized that it doesn't work. Well, the Brits knew that. And so they do elections and whatnot differently. Um, and some of it goes into the courts and some of it, they have different rules governing elections. Now, I don't know how much of that is applicable to us. But again, in terms of sort of the anger, and if we think about the Tories and the Whigs as, you know, not even going into the same coffee houses, again, it can be... Um, the frequency of election cycles. And again, I'm not sure that's something we can change, but can also be toning down the rhetoric. Um, if, if you want to make some changes, if you want to push this kind of bill or that kind of bill through Congress, couch it in ways that don't alarm people. You might get farther. So <laughs> that's my takeaway. <laughs> yeah, like I said earlier, and I'll say it again, it was just, one, I re greatly enjoyed the book and I, just hearing about stories, especially about these women who I did not know, um, and I'm now need to go find more. <laughs> um, but it, it just it's a little bizarre when you read something that happened so many hundreds of years ago, and then it feels at the same time so familiar. It was I thought it was fascinating, and I um, just want to thank you so much for coming and speaking to us all tonight. This has been so interesting. Oh, it was a pleasure. I've really enjoyed speaking with you and I really am grateful to the Library and Historical Society for inviting me. It was, it was really fun. Thank you. And if you're, having me. if you're interested in picking up a copy of the book, Backlash, um, we are, the Learned Isle is selling signed copies, the link's in the chat. Um, and I want to thank you all again for joining us this evening.